Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Better Traders Podcast. I'm your host, Rune. And on today's episode, we are talking to Gareth Selloway, a seasoned trader for over 20 years. He's the president, CFO, chief market strategist at the inmoneystocks.com and verified investing crypto.com. So let's just jump right in. Hi, Gareth. How are you Hi doing? Hi there. Today? Thank you so Hi. much for having me. And I'm, I'm doing wonderfully well. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. So let's just jump right in. Um, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Where are you from and where did you grow up? So I, I've been kind of all over the country. Um, I, I was born in Colorado, moved to Massachusetts, then New York, and then eventually Florida, then Oregon, then back to Florida. So kind of been all over. Um, wow. I always like exploring new places and, and it's, it's fun. You know, now I have a family, so it's a little bit more, you know, we're putting down some roots here, but, but yeah, it's, it's been a great trek. Um, I grew up early in my career. Both parents were teachers and uh, well, in my early years, we're talking when I was very, very young mm -hmm. and we, you know, just in regards to investing, we didn't really have investments in our household. We were kind of middle income, lower income kind of family. And, and it really was something brand new to discover when I did discover, um, you know, investing and, and that happened in high school. So, so interestingly enough, and I, I hope you don't mind me going into this story, but but no, not at all. what was really cool about it was that, you know, it was the late nineties. I was in high school, never invested or thought about investing in my life. And I joined the investment club. Oh, this sounds good. You know, it's going to look good on a resume for college. You know, all those kind of normal things that kids think about at that age. Yeah. Um, and it happened to be in the late nineties when the dot com bubble was, was kind of getting bigger and bigger, much like crypto, you know, a year ago or so. Mm -hmm. And I had a fake 100,000 account. And before you knew it, in like a week or two or three weeks, I was making like $100,000, $200,000 because these dot coms were just doubling, tripling, quadrupling, you know, in a matter of days. And I looked at it, right? And I'm like, holy cow, like, is this the way it is? You know, and if it is, then I have to figure this out. I have to go into this career because it just seems like the money just falls out of the sky. Now, we all know it doesn't do that, right? I mean, it was it was a specific period and um, it was all fake money, but it was addicting nonetheless. And then I said, all right, well, I have to, uh, I have to follow this passion. I have to go this route and, uh, and try, to, try to figure out trading. I love that. I mean, taking a passion into a career, what, what could be better? Yeah. Um, so just for a quick sec, I just want to back up a little bit and talk about your family and growing up. Mm -hmm. um, so was your family comfortable with money? Would you say that they had any budgets or no real monetary restrictions? How, how did they manage household expenses? Yeah. I, oh, I mean, there definitely was, we were on a strict budget. In fact, I still remember when I, when I was very young, we would go out to eat once a week and it was to friendlies. I don't know. I mean, I don't even know if that restaurant is around anymore, but they used to have conehead Sundays, which were just delicious, but we would go on Wednesdays because kids ate free. All right. So, you know, my sister and I, we'd eat for free and my parent, you know, so, you know, maybe our dinner bill was like 10 bucks or 15 bucks, but it was, I mean, that's really all we could afford at that point. So it was definitely a restrictive kind of thing because, because my parents, you know, they were both teaching in a private school that didn't allow, you know, it wasn't like they were getting paid a lot of money. A lot of teachers honestly don't make a lot of money depending on where they are. Um, yeah. So we were, we were definitely, you know, but at the same time, as, as a kid, I didn't know that. Right. I mean, I had a great childhood. I played outside all the time and, and, you know, we didn't have the internet back then or Facebook or any of that stuff to get kind of sidetracked on. So, you know, in, interestingly enough, I grew up in a household where I really wasn't allowed to watch TV either, which, you know, looking back on it, I think was a real benefit because For I sure. didn't get caught up in kind of all the, you know, the stuff that you see on TV. So, so yeah, it was, it was an interesting, it was, it was a great childhood. I would say um, I built forts outside. I dug holes. I, you know, worked in the garden, you know, all the, all the stuff kids you would hope would do today. That's amazing. Uh, and with that, what was your perception of money growing up? I'm really curious to know, uh, having all these uh, budgets in place, what would you say your perception was of it at the time? Yeah, I, I think like, you know, for, for the most part, it was, I, I still remember occasionally, maybe once a week, we were allowed, maybe I had 50 cents or, or something, and we would go to the candy store, I think it was like the convenience store, but we would go and get, you know, you could spend 
you know, there's a five cent like piece of bazooka Joe gum or, you know, you, and, and that was like, that was the extent of it. I mean, I, I, I don't even think I got an allowance really until probably high school. And even then it was maybe a couple dollars a week um, just because that's, that was what it was. And, and, you know, I had to help out with chores. We actually had a chore wheel in my house where, you know, it would rotate and like, you know, you, you either Heather had to do the vacuuming or the dusting or the bathroom or the kitchen. Right. So it, we had four in our family and it would rotate and, and we had to do one of those things. So, I mean, it was, it was a, it was, it was one of those things where it's, it's much different than my life now, but I like that aspect. And I really try to, you know, with my current kids, which are pretty young, I want to kind of implement that same kind of thing. I want to have a garden. I want to, I want to have them outside. We try not to let them watch TV because letting a kid be a kid and growing up with getting their hands dirty, I think is so, so important. Absolutely. I'm curious to know if, your childhood maybe inspire you to learn about economy or finance at all. Could you talk to me a little bit about um, what, what inspired you to, to go down that route? Yeah. So, so in terms of economics, which I majored in, in college, um, you know, I, I think it was, it was, I don't know if the childhood itself, or at least maybe, maybe subconsciously it did, but it was really when I got into the investment world in, in, in the investment club in high school and I saw you know, it was, I mean, think about this coming from a kid where, where you didn't grow up with a lot of money and, you know, a dollar or two a week was kind of what I saw. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, even though it was fake making a hundred thousand in a week or two, I mean, that was just, it was just mind blowing. And, and like, it was like, I, I didn't even know that existed in the world. Right. And, and at that point I said to myself, well, I have to figure out how do I get into this as a career? Like what career even is a trader? Right. I didn't really think about, oh, I could trade my own money. And so I said, okay, I'll major in economics because then I can get a job maybe at a firm afterwards and start to get into it. And so that's what I did. I dabbled in trading a little bit in, in college and kind of did that thing. And, and in after college, I went to work for MetLife. And what was interesting is MetLife is a great company, but I was on the investment team. But again, I was the low man on the totem pole, right? So, so they were like, all right, go make a hundred cold calls. And like, you know, cold calls is like brutal, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Some people are good at it. I was never good at that. The reject, I didn't want the rejection on the phone, people hanging up on you, telling you to go, you know, you know, uh, you know, off yeah. <laughs> um, all that kind of stuff. And so I just hated it. And it, at, after a year, and my mom always told me, you know, stick with a job for a year because it doesn't look good on your resume. If you just bounce after six months or three months. So I stayed right. there for a year. And then I said, okay, I quit. I'm going to take, I had $10,000 saved, just 10,000 at that point. And I said, I'm going to go learn to trade. And I basically went to a firm. They gave me 50,000 in, le in leverage. So 10,000 was mine, 40,000 was theirs. And mm -hmm. I started to try to trade. And I knew nothing. I mean, at this point I was still brand new. Um, didn't know what I was doing. I was losing money. It would always come out of my 10,000. So it was just dwindling down. And so I literally was a bartender at night. I would teach bartending nice. on the weekends to people that wanted to be bartenders. I would work at a catering company on the weekends. And my goal was always to just reiterate that this is the passion, the trading side. So I have to work hard and make it money and then just put it in my trading account, right? Just keep putting it in. I would lose it, put it in more, lose it, put it in. And, and that was really the steps that I took until finally I turned a corner in investing where I began to make money and it didn't come overnight. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, I'd have a few more winners in a week and then still some nasty losers. And then the next week, maybe a little bit more. And it was a slow kind of slow slope up. And finally, again, getting to that point of profitability was, a, it was a long stretch, but it was a, it was, it was an exciting thing to get to. I love that. Uh, I hate to back up a little bit, but I, I'm really curious to know who you looked up to most as a child. Mm. Does anyone that's come a, to mind? That's a good question. So, you know, one of my teachers in high school was, uh, was a man by the name of Maurizio. And he, he, he was a teacher because he loved teaching, but he mm -hmm. did real estate development at the time. And he developed big mansions in the Hamptons. And he, you know, we would always joke that, you know, the common joke was that he would change, change his cars as much as he changed his underwears. You know, he, he, he'd come in a Porsche one day and then, you know, and it was just like, again, it was like, you know, he was first of all, the coolest, most down to earth, nicest guy in the world. He really took me under his wing um, in, in that respect. And, and that was definitely someone I looked up to um, in, in, in his life, in my life, and kind of was, you know, in a way I saw the way he was living and it's not like, you know, by no means do I have multiple cars or anything like that. Cause it's in, in honestly, it's a bad investment, but, but it's, <laughs> It's seeing that, right, yeah. that, 
it's seeing that and being able to say, okay, well, if I want something, I can go buy it or I can go right. do something or I can take a vacation. And to have that ability was really kind of eye-opening and very cool. What did he teach just out of curiosity? Science, actually. Science, Science. okay, and, interesting. Yeah. Nice, yeah. nice. I love that. Um, what were some of the life lessons that you've learned and from your childhood and, and that you still use to this day in your professional and personal life? Wow. Um, I would say the, the, the work ethic, right? I mean, it, it, I was always in a family where it was like, you know, there's no sense in complaining about it. You just got to get it done and go do it. Right. And right. there's always a way to figure it out how to get it done. Um, and the more you complain, the more time it takes anyway. So what's the point, right? Um, you know, that's the kind of household that we grew up in. And, and I think it shaped, it shaped me in terms of saying, okay, well, now I see what I want to do in terms of becoming a trader. And I'm just going to go straight for being a trader and nothing's going to derail that. If I got to work three jobs on the side, I'm going to work three jobs on the side. Right. And could you tell me what your first job was? I'm pretty curious to know. I was, uh, so when I was 15, I think I got a kind of a counselor in training job at a summer program. And, and that's oh, really, okay. I mean, really as soon as I could work. And I still remember, interestingly enough, I had to get my working papers because I don't think they were allowed to hire me without getting those working papers. But yeah, I mean, you know, from a very early age, I was doing that. I would, I was a babysitter, you know, at nighttime, you know, a lot, I was well, relatively well known since my parents were teachers. So I would baby be a babysitter. And that was another way to earn money kind of around that same time. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know if you had any financial mentors growing up at all, any friends or family members close in your circle at the time? Um, I had, I had, I had one, one of the closest people that was kind of a trading mentor in a way financial, he, he traded just small caps. And, and when I first got into trading, you know, I, I started to trade alongside him and he was definitely kind of the mentor type, but, but for the most part, he didn't trade off of charts. It was all momentum based. So he would look at what stocks are hot, what, you know, what sectors are moving and he'd find a small stock that was probably going to move or starting to uptick. And he would hop on board. Amazingly good at it. You know, I was never that great at it. I, I was good at finding small caps, but again, you know, the liquidity of them is an issue for me and so forth. So in my trading career, I've, I've geared more, more of my trading towards large large caps and charting, which has worked really well for me. But in terms of that, I, I think my parents were really, you know, I, I always remember the lesson they said, they said, never carry a balance on your credit card, do whatever you can to pay it off because the credit card company is just going to, you know, jack you for, for fees. And basically they said, well, don't spend on it unless you can pay it off at the end of the month. Um, sure. You know, obviously there are certain individuals, certain people that can't, you know, you have, they have to carry a balance. But for me, I, I was lucky enough that even, at, at my level of financial stability, I was able to still make those decisions and, and be able to pay it off. Amazing. Uh, so you mentioned that you attended university and you studied economics. Which university did you attend and, and what was the goal with studying economics? Did you always know from day one that you were going to enter the financial markets? Yeah, I think I think ever since that high school period, I, I it was always kind of like which which is going to be my um, my major to get me to my end goal in terms right. of that being driven. But um, you know, college I went to Binghamton University, which is in up, upstate New York. Um, for me, college was much more of a social experiment. Um, I didn't necessarily perform amazingly well. I, I was always like a B student, which isn't bad. But but you know, for me, it was like. You know, I, I went to a school where I was tw uh, 20 people in my high school, in my whole class, right? So very small. Um, I never really had a girlfriend um, in high school or anything like that. So college was my kind of like, okay, this is now my social time, which thank goodness I chose. So interestingly enough, um, my parents said I had to pay for 66% of my education in college and, I, and, and they would pay for 33%, right? So so going in, there was a private school that was like at the time 30 or 40,000 a year. And then there was Binghamton, which was a state school, which was like, you know, 10,000 a year. And of course, putting it in terms of monetary, which one, you, which if you're paying for some of it, which one are you going to do? I chose yeah. the state school because it was less money, obviously. Not and I'm glad I did that because, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I did that because college for me, again, was a social experiment. It was mm -hmm. about having fun. Um, I did all my, my classes and I did okay. And I got my degree, but, but I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't going for valedictorian or, you know, whatever the, you know, those type of things. It was, it was definitely me figuring out myself. I love that. Okay. So paint me a picture of your early career outside of, of school. Uh, what were you doing and where were you living at the time? 
So after college, I moved in back in with my parents. They were they were kind enough to let me do that. Um, and uh, one of the things though was that I had to pay them rent. So you know, mm, okay. yeah, it was interesting. Now it wasn't a lot. I think it was like five hundred a month or something. And I and I was working for MetLife, so I was making enough money to pay for that. Um, but you know, just like any any young young guy, I wanted to be out on my own. Um, but I didn't have a lot of money. So a a a, a a man or, or, or a friend of mine, I met him at the gym. I was working out at the time and he's like, Hey, listen, I'm making my basement into an apartment. You can move in there for, I think it was 400 a month or something like that. So, so that was really, I ended up moving into there and, and I lived out of my friend's basement for a while. And then kind of just, you know, slowly as I was getting a handle on trading started to eventually upgrade. Eventually I even, you know, I, I was lucky enough to to be in Florida. And I bought a beachfront condo on the beach in 2012. It was absolutely gorgeous. Um, There was no one living in the building at the time uh, because of the housing crisis. And they were just like begging for me to, you know, or anyone to buy, but no one was. And I said, you know what? I looked at the charts on the, on the, on the, the, you know, the, the housing side, and it looked like the market was bottoming. I said, all right, Mm -hmm. I'll do it. I'm young. I can, I can weather the storm. And I bought it. Um, I made them include all the furniture. It was a fully furnished kind of like model unit. And I said, all right, I'll pay you below asking, but throw in all the furniture, which was like $120,000 in furniture. And they did. And um, I ended up selling it a few years later for I think 1.1 or something like that. But, wow. but the idea, the idea was that it was, it was all about, you know, being at that point where you, you, I could make those decisions, those financial decisions that I looked up to my friend, my mentor when I was younger, and mm-hmm. he was building houses in the Hamptons and had a house in the Hamptons. And now I was at that point. So very cool stuff. And, and again, everything to me is an investment, even in a part, uh, condo like that. You know, I, I looked at it and I said, okay, to me, the market was getting toppy, although I wish I had held it for longer considering sure. where housing prices are. But yeah, I mean, it, it was like, all right, bank it. Let's move on to the next investment and, and see where we go. Wow, I wish my rent cost four hundred dollars. Can those prices come back, please? Like, yeah. that yeah, just that, sounds so nice. That was like early two thousand. <laughs> so yeah, I know, uh, yeah, seriously. I mean that sounds Crazy. nice. But um, <laughs> I'm curious to know if you have a mentor today or like a group of people that you discuss uh, discuss the market with on a regular basis. Um, I think for me, so and this is kind of interesting. Is like I'm at a point where you know uh, in my career. I do a lot of talking to my members of the, of my websites and stuff like that, where mm-hmm. we're trading and I have a headset on, you know, throughout the day where I'm calling out my day trades. So believe it or not, I really like when I'm not trading the markets to kind of just have quiet and I have my kids. And so I don't get much quiet in that respect, but, mm. but, um, but it's, it's nice to kind of step away. I found that sometimes when the market is so intense and we've seen it in cryptocurrency and in stocks recently, I live and breathe it. And I'm even up, I even wake up in the middle of the night and check stock quote, quotes and futures and crypto yeah. prices. And that taking time away is so important because I, I do, I, I, from time to time will deal with anxiety, right? Where it just, it kind of, it's not that anything's wrong, but it's just so intense, so for focused sure. for so long that it kind of gets to you. So believe it or not, I, I enjoy just not you know, just relaxing in a weird way. Like I love throwing on comedies, like old Seinfeld episodes and just relaxing. <laughs> That's perfect. I, I really like that. Could you maybe just touch on your website a little bit and, and what you offer? Yeah, sure. So in the money stocks.com is, is the stock website. And, and basically what it, what I do is I run a service on it called verified investing alerts, where mm-hmm. anytime I take a trade, whether it's a stock or an ETF, I put it out for members to see, I give them my exact entry, my, my expected targets, all that kind of information. And then when I sell it, I also post it up immediately. And the idea being is that you know, knowing how to read charts relatively well, they can follow me and make money and they do make really good money. Um, I also do a daily video and the daily video I've always said is more valuable because what I do in it is I, for 20 minutes every day, I look at charts, I show how I'm calculating levels, why I'm taking trades here, what level do I expect this market or this stock to go to? And it really gives people a lot of education, right? So it's a 20 minute webinar every single day. So that's wow. that's that service. Um, I also run verified investing crypto uh, dot com, which is just for cryptocurrencies, but it's structured the same way. Every time mm-hmm. I take a crypto trade, it goes in there. Same thing with exits. And I do a daily video, even with the crypto, I do them on the weekends too. So, uh, wow. but again, 20 minutes I can spare on the weekends to get people up to date on what's going on. Yeah. It sounds like you're very busy. Um, 
<laughs> I'm curious, when did you begin to find your stride in the equities market? Uh, you know, how and when did you know that this is exactly where I'm meant to be? The answer might be obvious, but I'm, I'm curious to know. Well, you know, there was always, there's always unfortunately doubts, right? So mm -hmm. early in my career, you know, even, even early when I launched in the money stocks, which was back in 2007 is when we launched it, which is, I mean, crazy 15 years ago at this point, but you know, there was always points where I would go, you know, in the beginning when you don't have a lot of money and I was, I was just building my wealth at that point, but I was, I was always like, you know, you'd have a bad spurt, right. Where you have a couple of losers in a row and you just start to question, like, you know, first of all, am I going to lose my money? Is, am I right on this, this trade? And then, Am I, do I, do I, am I going to survive in this business even? And I think that was really, yeah. I mean, it was, it was really something that until maybe, you know, I would say in 2012, it started to take on a different mentality where I started to, and by the way, interestingly enough, I even told my, my wife that I was like, you know, listen, if this doesn't work out, I might be working at McDonald's, you know, who knows, you know, it's just, you just kind of have this mentality where the market has a way of beating you down early on mm -hmm. until you get to that proven long-term profitability. And what I mean by that is you have to look and say, how many months am I up? Well, you know, what am I up and how many months straight? And, and you're going to have a losing month here and there. That's just inevitable. But the idea is after five years, when you look back and you say, okay, well, you know, five years ago, I lost three months out of, out of 12, then it was two, and then it was one. And, you know, generally it's one a month per year. Eventually you can say, okay, I finally have this down where I'm going to be able to survive in this business. But again, a lot of people in the crypto markets are probably thinking that right now, because you've seen Dogecoin collapse. I mean, even yeah. Bitcoin is down and they're saying to themselves, you know, I thought I was going to be looking at Bitcoin at a hundred thousand and now it's at, you know, 40,000 you know, what's going to happen. I put so much money in and it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough path, but again, I, I encourage education, education, you're going to mm -hmm. pay the market or you're going to pay someone to educate you. It's generally, and I found this the hard way it's cheaper to pay someone, right? So That's if the market is going to charge you, right. If the market's <laughs> yeah. going to charge you for education, they're going to charge you a ton more yeah. than yeah. someone who has good information. So always mm -hmm. remember that. Yeah. I mean, confidence is gained in time and practice, right? So That's I think right. education is a beautiful route to go when learning how to trade crypto hundred percent. And, and I think one more point too, about that is like, you know, people come into trade crypto or stocks or anything and, and they're like, all right, well, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to start making money. But remember it's a career mm -hmm. and you have people that you're going to make the same money as a brain surgeon or, you know, and think about what brain surgeons have to do. They have to go through like so many years of of schooling, right? And then they have to pay so much money that, that, I mean, it's, it's inevitable that you have to think that you have to, you're going to have to go through some education, right? And again, it's either the market teaching you or, or are you paying for it? So I, again, education is so important. It'll save you so much money in the long run. For sure. Uh, so I just want to fast forward a little bit to the moment that you heard of Bitcoin for the first time, where and oh, when goodness. did you first hear of BTC? I'm curious. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't remember the exact moment I heard of Bitcoin, but I do remember this. And this is something crazy. So Bitcoin had made a run to like 2,500. And I don't honestly remember what year this was, but we're probably talking like 2014 maybe or so. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm going back on the chart now just to kind of see. I have to go back really far here. But, but yeah, so there was a point where it topped out around 2,500. And I still remember saying, you know what, I got to buy this when it comes back in. And I think I put my order just below a thousand dollars being like, all right, well, it'll come down right around there. And I remember it came within like five bucks of filling me and then it just went up and wow. you know, I never got my wow. Bitcoin and looking back on it, it's like, oh, geez. But now again, would I have held it all the way to 65? I, probably not. You know, I mean, I probably would have sold it at some point prior, but, you know, obviously since then I've been in and out of Bitcoin. Um, you know, I was a buyer back in 2019 when it was mm -hmm. in the, in the, you know, under sub 10,000 level. And then again, you know, I sold too early. I sold a huge chunk when it got back to the 2017 high near 20,000, just because I, I figured that would be a short-term top. And then we saw it just rip right through that. So, you know, investing is a matter of taking profits. What I always say is no one ever goes broke taking a profit, but you, you have to be aware that if you leave your money in the market and you get too greedy, they say pigs get slaughtered and that's the truth. Right. Um, 
I'm curious to know what struck your interest the most about Bitcoin. What was the catalyst that, that made you buy it in the first place? Yeah, so I've always been someone who is is financially aware, and I think this comes from my upbringing. And mm-hmm. when I see the Federal Reserve, just you know, every time we get in a little bit of a crisis. Now, COVID was a big crisis, but I mean, prior, you know, any little recession, they come out and lower interest rates, they print more money. Looking at the government just spending trillions and running up the national debt plus 30, 30 trillion at this point, you know, that's where to me Bitcoin has its its genius. The twenty one million maximum run. You know, the way where you can say, okay, well, you know, I can diversify in some gold, which is a good way to do it too. But also now you have this new asset, Bitcoin, where you can also diversify out of dollars and protect yourself. And mm-hmm. we're, the US is the biggest kid on the block right now. So, so the dollar is holding up. There will be a point where that doesn't continue, where the U- US debt, where the printing of money causes the dollar to decline seriously. And we're already seeing it with inflation, right? 8% For inflation sure. means that yeah. you know, your dollar is only worth 92 cents a year later. It's pretty scary, mm-hmm. but that's going to continue and the dollar will start to really collapse. And again, we might be five, 10 years out from this, but, but at that point, you got to have your money diversified in other places to protect yourself. You know, again, right. being in dollars, even being in stocks is risky because I think there'll be a massive decline in, in, in U.S. equities, too, at some point. For sure. And to even touch on the risk, um, have you ever gone all in on a token or a particular stock or, or are you just all for diversification? So in my early years, yes. And I learned yes. the hard lesson, I, you know, in my early in my early years, not so with crypto, because I by the time I was really investing in crypto, my career was pretty far along and I'd learned my lessons. But you know, early in my career, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I still remember a day trade I took, you know, I had about a hundred thousand in my, my day trading, my, my trading account at that point. And in one day I lost $70,000 in that one day trade. It just kept on going down and I kept on dollar cost averaging, assuming it would bounce and it just never did. And at the end of the day, I had to close it out. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it was like, I still remember being in a haze, right? Like, is this real life? Am I dreaming? Like, what am I going to wake up? Like what's going on here? And then, you know, my one of my things is logic, right? So I always try to bring myself and ground myself. And so what I did in that situation, and I've done it since in other situations is always remind myself, do I have a a, a roof over my head? Do I have food to eat? Can I make more money? Mm -hmm. And if those answers are yes, then you're fine. And you can go back and work. And and I'm proof in, in that of where I am now in my career, that that you can do that you can you can get wiped out, you can start over and still make it huge but you have to pick yourself up and learn from your mistakes. Absolutely. And in the equities market, I know leverage trading is not uncommon. And in crypto markets, I'm curious to know if you're seeing a lot of leverage trades going on. Um, When it comes to crypto, what are your thoughts on using leverage? Yeah, so I I don't use leverage with my crypto trading, um, mainly because, again, you know, I probably at this point, I have enough capital in those accounts to cover the trades that I want. But, you know, mm-hmm. especially when you see an asset that can drop 80% from high to low or low to, you know, and even the, some of the intric drops can be so dramatic. You have to understand that if you're leveraged out even three to one, you know, you get a big enough overnight drop on a blip on Bitcoin, it could just wipe. I mean, you could be forced to sell or your broker could actually sell for you. So, so I really caution people about it. You know, in investing, it's it's the marathon, right? It's it's a marathon, not a sprint. You mm-hmm. want to do it slowly and you'll compound your profits over time. It'll just amass into a fortune. What you can't afford is getting wiped out. And I, I you know, proof in the pudding, if I hadn't gotten wiped out as many times as I did earlier, I'd have a lot more than I do now. But people have to remember that it's there's no get rich quick scheme. Occasionally it works, but it sets you up for the major fall later on when you get addicted to that kind of throwing all your money in something and it going up, eventually it goes down and then you get in trouble. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to know why you transitioned to crypto in, in the first place, arguably a more volatile, uh, volatile space, mm-hmm. depending on obviously which tokens you're investing in. And since it's still a relatively new and unexplored market, I'm just curious to know where the desire came from to get involved. So, so I think part of the desire was that 
I do believe in cryptocurrency longer term, mainly Bitcoin and maybe some of the other coins. And so I see this long term vision of, of the dominance of something like a Bitcoin and how it can actually diversify you out of the risk of printing the printing money type stuff that we see. But also, you know, doing the stock service, people were just coming to me and saying, you know, hey, listen, could you start a crypto service? Could you start giving crypto calls? And the beautiful thing about charts and everything I do is based on charts, which charts give you probabilities, right? Probability of a move in this direction or that direction is that they're the same. It could be a stock chart. It could be a commodity, a, a, a currency or a crypto chart. They act the same because charts are created by humans that are buying and selling and humans that are buying and selling are trading off of emotion. So it doesn't matter what it is. If it's a chart, it's going to be based on emotion, fear and greed, and therefore charts work the same. So it's really a very natural thing to go to the crypto market and say, okay, well, here's a chart of Bitcoin. Let's trade it. You know, it could be a stock for all I care. It doesn't really matter. It's tradable. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the awesome thing about it. I love that. And now I'm, now I need to know where you spend most of your time. Would you say in the equities or the crypto market and why? Still the equities markets. And, okay. and I'll tell you, yeah. So so <laughs> one of the one of the negatives of cryptocurrency right now is that generally cryptos all move together, right? So, you know, if Bitcoin's dropping 10%, it's very rare Ethereum's gonna be up 5%, right? So they're all going down or all going up together in general. Um, with stocks, it's different. Stocks can have earnings where one stock can rip higher, even if the market's down. There's always, and there's so many different stocks, different large cap stocks, that there's always different trades in both directions on the market. So, you know, whether it's, you know, investing in Chinese stocks or, or South American stocks or US stocks, or, you know, you can be long, you can be short. So there's so many varieties that I actually find that I still have way more opportunities in the equity markets, but not to say crypto isn't fun. I'll tell you, it's a great, it's a great market to be in. I love that. So, I mean, now it's time for some advice. Uh, so first time traders are constantly making mistakes. What is one of your first trading mistakes that you've made in the past? And what is a common mistake beginners are making today? I know you previously touched on a little bit of, um, you know, getting wiped out, yeah. but I, I'm curious to know if maybe there's another little mistake in there somewhere. So, so one of the things to, to keep in mind is that, is that, investors in general, new investors, and I did this all the time, is what they assume that they're going to be right when they go in the trade, right? So there's this, this almost like, I'm going to put all my money in a trade because it's going to go up. You know, I'm going to buy Bitcoin here because it's going to go straight up and I'm going to be right. They're not taking into account the probabilities that it goes against them. So maybe there's a 60% chance it goes up, but there's still 40% chance it goes down. One of the best changes I made in my career, which has actually been in the last really like five or six years, is that I start with a smaller than normal position size. So I might say, okay, you know, in Bitcoin, let's talk about Bitcoin. So with Bitcoin, you know, I started with a position in Bitcoin at, believe it or not, 48,000 was my first entry, right around 48,000. But I, but I, I said, all right, I'm going to buy a hundred thousand dollars in Bitcoin. I'm going to just put 20,000 in here. And then what it enabled me to do is when I was wrong and it came down, I was able to dollar cost average. And I just bought another 20,000 here. And then, and then when it got to my next major level, which was 30, just around 33,000, that's when I went in with a little heavier position. And when it mm -hmm. bounced, I was able to make 10% on that position just by doing that. So, so it kind of enables you to, to correct for errors that the market is naturally going to throw at you. And again, the key is going into a trade, be humble enough to know that the market can do anything at any one point, And you need some of those extra kind of bullets on the side to use them if you need them. Absolutely. And I mean, a lot of people have the tendency of getting really anxious when they're trading, right? Purely on emotion. Yeah. Uh, how do you get ready to trade mentally? Is there anything that you do or any kind of method that you stick to when trading in order to get, um, in, in order to mitigate any emotional tendencies? So or like you said, is, you're all for the charts. <laughs> yeah. And so, and that's one of the great things about the charts is that the charts take the emotion out. You know, when you hit support, that's the buy signal when you hit resistance. So you never chase on charts. Like if a chart is going up like Bitcoin at 65, 67, 68,000, you never let that hype get you and make get in the trade because there's no technical reason there to do it. But I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the emotional side, number one, you know, the longer you trade, the less emotion you have, because eventually you start getting in a cycle of saying, okay, listen, you know, 
every out of every 10 trades, eight are going to be winners, which means two are going to be losers. That's just the way it is. And, and you just go forward, but your odds again are 80% once you really learn the charts and that's fine. Over the longer term, you're just making money, making money. Here's your loser. Okay. It's one of my two losers out of every 10 On to the next one I go. Um, so I think that's really important. The other thing is a lot of newer investors, they go too heavy, right? So they, they put too much money in a trade, which makes them overly emotional, which then in tune makes them likely to make the wrong decision. So it's going against them. And, and when it's max against them, because they put too much money, they're going to be like, all right, I got to get out of this trade. And it's just then that it's going to turn in the opposite direction and go in the direction. But the market will push them to that extreme. What I would recommend, and this is, you know, it's, it may not be practical, but if I had a trading floor of, of brand new traders, I would strap them all with a heart rate monitor, right? <laughs> and I would say, okay, here's $100,000 each. Now trade, but I don't want to see your heart rate go up at all. And wow. what that's going to do is, you know, imagine if you put like, I mean, like imagine someone just puts like $10 in a trade out of yeah. 100,000, their heart rate wouldn't go up, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that means that's okay. Now, what you would do is you would inch it up to $20, maybe $100, there's going to be a point where your heart rate does start to gyrate. And that's the point where you need to back it off a little bit and go back down. And then once you prove to yourself by trading at that limit for a hundred trades or whatever it is, then when you raise it, let's say to $150, your heart rate may not move because you've consistently proven to yourself that you know what you're doing. And then again, do it for another hundred trades. If your heart rate is stationary, up your amount a little bit more. And by that way, you can actually make sure that your emotion is always on track to being, being neutral. Right. And I mean, some people's emotions can be influenced by social media. As we know, right. it's a very influential resource for some traders. So with regards to playing up certain tokens, you know, having enough power to push or pull a token in a bearish or bullish direction. I'm curious to know if you've ever fallen prey to what is floating around on crypto Twitter. I, I just because I'm at the point in my career, I haven't. In fact, okay, I good. Use, yeah, but but again, in my early career, I would have. Like if I if I it was if I was just starting out, then there's no doubt about it. I mean, Twitter mm -hmm. and 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 these places have amplified emotion and people pumping and these influencers and all that stuff, and it makes it very hard for newer investors to control their emotion. I understand that. Right. You know, one of the things I do now is I actually use it as a contrarian view, meaning that. When I saw, for instance, when we were near 65 to 69,000 in November, the amount of hype, and I know this because I would post something like, like, I don't think Bitcoin's going to break out on Twitter. And then the amount of hate that I would get was just incredible. Like, oh, you don't know what you're doing. You're, you're an idiot. Uh, and, and those type of signals are great contrarian views, which actually reinforced my bearish case. And so, again, the idea is you can actually use it to your advantage if you don't get caught up in it by reading it. When you get max greed and max hype, short it. When you get max fear and max panic, that's when you need to be buying. That is really true that it can be very indicative of that. Um, I'm curious to know what you would tell someone in regards to uh, if they're new to trading and they're seeing all this orchestrated hype on Twitter, would you tell them to just ignore it or even just take it with a grain of salt? Yeah, in the very least, take it with a grain of salt. Um, right. you know, I, I think that's so, so important. You have to remember that you know, people have ulterior motives, right? And I'm not saying it's, you know, anything super shady, but anyone who's pumping Bitcoin is probably long Bitcoin and has a reason <laughs> to pump it, right? You know, this was a, a thing where, you know, it, CNBC, which is for stocks, right? Um, and they cover crypto too now, but CNBC, the business channel, people are like, oh, well, they're talking, you know, Kramer's talking about this or someone's talking about this about a buy and they're always getting people excited, but you have to look at what what's their motivation. So, for, for CNBC or these business channels, they need to sell advertising spots. To sell advertising, they need people watching. So it's in their, it's in their incentive. They're incentivized to get people hyped up, mm -hmm. to sell, to get more watchers so their, their advertising dollars go up. So it's always important to kind of look at the ulterior kind of factors, and then you can make a judgment per yourself knowing all the facts. And I think that's so, so important. So again, if you see too much hype, step back. It's the hardest thing to do but it will save you money. There's no doubt about it. That's great advice. Um, so where do you see crypto heading in the next decade? And what do you think we can expect from it this year? This can be regards to Bitcoin or just crypto in yeah. general. So, so for me, I have, you know, I have, even though Bitcoin bounced off a major support at, at 33,000, um, I think this is just an interim bounce before it heads lower. 
Um, I do have a price target sub 20,000. I don't know how much lower than 20,000 it'll go, maybe just to 20,000. I know that's not what people want to hear, but if you look at what's going on, if you look at past cycles in Bitcoin, you know, you're getting, you get an 80% drawdown. I mean, even if you get a 70% drawdown, you're still down to 20,000 or sub 20,000. So people need to be ready for that. Um, it All it would be doing would be replicating past cycles and then it can go on to new all-time highs. So I am over, you know, overall bearish on Bitcoin for the next year or two. And I think at that point, you will see the, the emergence of it as a real store of safety. I'm hopeful that we get some government regulation. I know everyone's scared about regulation, but if you ever want pension funds, which have trillions and trillions of dollars, if you ever want older generations to buy in, you need some sort of safety net in the crypto world. Right now, it's still the Wild West out there, whether it's mm -hmm. NFTs or whether it's people getting into your account, stealing your Bitcoin. It's not FDIC insured like stock accounts are where they, you know, the government will give you your money back. So there's so many different things here that need to be fixed, but I do think it will get fixed. And then I see Bitcoin, honestly, in the next decade, I would be shocked if it doesn't get to 500,000. Wow. Uh, do you ever see crypto becoming bigger than gold? I have to ask now that you put such a beautiful estimate on Bitcoin becoming, you know, a near $500,000 in the future, gold has always been a, it's always been a great commodity. So yeah. what are your thoughts on that? I do think it does become bigger than gold at some point. Um, you know, wow. I, I don't necessarily think in the next few years, but I think that people want a store of safety that offsets the ability for governments to print unless endless amounts of money or run up debt and gold as good as it is you know if you buy some gold you know and i have i have a little bit of physical gold and i have investments in gold it's it's the investments in like a gld which is an etf that tracks gold that's easy to sell but if you have physical gold you know it's it's not the easiest thing to sell um, and I like that aspect of Bitcoin, how easy it is to sell it on the open market, how you protect yourself, how the limited supply, you know, one of my, and this is a really long-term view on gold. So I'm very bullish on gold this year. I think it's going to outperform Bitcoin and the stock market. But if you ask me where gold is in 50 or hundred years, I think it's much, much lower. And the reason why I think it's much, much lower in that long-term is because you already have Elon Musk starting to talk about going and mining asteroids. And you go, you know, once you get this technology where they're out and mining different asteroids and different planets, there is so much gold in the universe that it probably will drive that, that price sharply lower. But again, strictly speaking about the next year or two, I actually think gold is probably a better investment than, than Bitcoin. Wow. That's, that's really, that's really interesting. I would have never seen that, but I love that. So, okay. So unfortunately this is the end of our interview, but before we go, where can we find you on social media, Gareth? Uh, my Twitter is the best place. That's the main place I am at Gareth Soloway. So basically at my first last name. Um, and again, I always try to throw out some good quality stuff there, some different charts. It's going to be stocks. It's going to be uh, economic macro views. It's going to be, you know, charts of crypto. All of that stuff is there. And again, it's the best place to kind of test me out, see what I have. And then you guys can decide from there. Okay. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been an absolute pleasure getting to know you and learn about you as a trader. Thank you so much, Rune. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. So for anyone interested in learning how to trade crypto, visit our website at www.thebettertraders.com to get started on your trading journey today. Until next time, my name is Rune and this is the Better Traders Podcast. Wow.